National Broadcasting Company presents The Magnificent Montague, starring Monty Woolley. <laughs> this is an age that shall be marked by the achievements of women, Madame Curie, Florence Nightingale, Carrie Nation. But all their accomplishments are overshadowed by the single triumph of Lily Boehm. She talked her husband, Edwin Montague, the magnificent Montague of the Shakespearean Theater, into going on radio as Uncle Goodhart, hero of an afternoon program. This not only broke his heart, but his eight-year record of unemployment. But today, Lily is beginning to wonder if it was such a good idea after all. It is the morning in the Montague apartment. Agnes, the maid, is about to answer the door. Okay, okay. Yeah? Another crate for Uncle Goodhart. Oh, brother. Okay, waltz it in. Sign here. Okay. Some more trash from the grateful listeners. The joint's starting to look like a pawn shop. <laughs> Agnes, would you please... What in heaven's name is that? Here's a letter come with it. From, uh, Lilliput, Ohio. What's this? Dear Uncle Goodhart. Enclosed, please find a six-foot replica of our city hall at Lilliput, Ohio. It was built with 2,000 cakes of your sponsor's soap. A little something for Uncle to play with in his bathtub. <laughs> Agnes, we've got to get rid of this. Uh-oh, here comes Uncle Hambo now. Just a cottage, small by um, E I O. Uh, good morning, Lily. I feel quite... Gad, what is that monstrosity? Agnes, have you been on another quiz program? <laughs> Edwin, sit down at the table. Your breakfast is here. What's this letter? Well, it came with the monstrosity. Dear Uncle Goodhart, enclosed a replica. Uh, so that's what it is. <laughs> it was built... Oh. Agnes, call up and have them take it away. Wait, uh, listen to this. It's rather touching. Every family in Lilliput donated their year's supply of Shalimar soap in order to make this model possible. Really, Lily, the least we can do is to keep it in the living room for a while. <laughs> now, Edwin... Imagine they gave up their year's supply of soap for me. You know, I, I'd like to visit the Lippert sometime. Better wait till next year when they get some more soap. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. I'll bet it's a pretty little place. When the wind's right. <laughs> My dear Agnes, you could easily be replaced by a cocker spaniel. <laughs> Edwin, your breakfast. Now, you have to go to your broadcast. Agnes. Okay, I'll bring in the grub. The, the grub. Really, Lily, don't you think that after 25 years with us, Agnes might have discovered that this is a home and not a lumber camp? <laughs> Here, uh, do you want the newspaper? Uh, just the radio section. Listen to this in the drama's news. Max Garland... Lily, must you mention that name? Me with an empty stomach. Oh, please listen. Max Garland today announced that his forthcoming production of Romeo and Juliet, starring Catherine Cornell and Laurence Olivier, has been temporarily postponed. Max Garland, putting on Romeo and Juliet with that juvenile vaudevillian, Laurence Olivier? <laughs> oh, Shakespeare, what crimes are committed in thy name? Oh, now, Edwin, just because Larry Olivier did Hamlet for the movies... Hamlet for the movies? It's like playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata on a kazoo. <laughs> Let me finish. Read on, Macduff. Mr. Olivier cannot leave England due to previous commitments. Uh, previous commitments. He's obviously in jail for impersonating an actor. <laughs> this is rich. Then it goes on... Uh, read it. Uh, nothing important. Read it, read it. This is all very amusing. Go on, go on, go on. Theatre-goers of yesteryear will remember Mr. Garland's great Shakespearean revival, starring the old-time favorite, Edwin the Magnificent Montague. The old-time favorite? <laughs> what am I, a horse car? <laughs> a bicycle built for two? Is a man an old-time favorite at the age of 43? 43? 43, and the subject is closed. <laughs> Read on. Here's your pancakes, younger than springtime. <laughs> ah, Lily, at our Thanksgiving dinner, when you brought that huge stuffed bird to the table, 
For one glorious, ecstatic moment, I thought it was Agnes. <laughs> She's such a doll. <laughs> Edwin, there's more in the article about the 15 years you and Max were associated. 15 years. For each and every minute of those 15 years, there's a gray hair in my beard. I don't want to hear any more about the theater. But, Edwin, you're going overboard on this Uncle Goodhart afternoon program. We don't go to any plays. Lily, please. I have a big day at the radio studio today. The boys came in with a very touching script. It seems a canary with a broken wing hops into Uncle Goodhart's little cottage. Everybody says, kill it, Uncle Goodhart. Put it out of its misery. But I cannot destroy any living thing. I make a little splint out of match sticks. Bind up the little broken wing. Suddenly the canary's eyes open. It looks up at me and then... And then it bursts into song. <laughs> and the farmer took another load away. <laughs> I do mean corn. <laughs> now, Lily, I was thinking about dear Agnes's Christmas present. Last year for her room, we got her a chair. This Christmas, can't we have it electrified? <laughs> Edwin, I'm serious. We build our whole lives around the theater. Lily, let's face reality. There is a new bright life in front of me. To ten million trusting listeners, I am not Edwin Montague, the great actor. I am Uncle Goodhart. And you... Me? Yes, you are not Lily Bohem, the actress. You are Uncle Goodhart's wife, Aunt Goodhart. <laughs> Uncle and Aunt Goodhart. The first one who mentions Cousin Agnes gets a shot in the head. <laughs> Lily Boehm, Aunt Goodhart. That's right. Get used to it, Lily. Oh, Gad, look at the time. I'll be late for rehearsal. Lily Boehm is here to see you, Mr. Garland. Lily, send her right in, Miss Cooper. Lily, sweetheart. Max. Lily, how do you do it? You look wonderful. How's the monster? Edwin's fine. Max, you look so... so healthy. Very simple. No Montague, no ulcers. <laughs> oh, Lily, I'm serious. It was eight years ago on a Thursday night when your husband and I had that final battle and we parted after 15 years. I remember that day, walking back to my office a broken, bitter man. And then it hit me. No more Montague. It was like the finale of Blossom Time. Suddenly birds were singing, bells began ringing, and everything was sunshine and light. No more Montague. <laughs> oh, now, Max, it wasn't that Lily, bad. it was a new world. I found out what people do at night. Do you know what people do at night, Lily? They sleep. <laughs> they don't pace the floor all night wondering if Montague was going to show up opening night with his own additional dialogue for Hamlet's soliloquy. <laughs> They sleep. Oh, come on, I man. found out that a man does not live on bromo seltzer alone. <laughs> For 15 years, I was on a liquid diet. <laughs> Nothing but bromo seltzer. Do you know I haven't had one bromo seltzer since that Thursday night eight years ago? No more Montague. It's a gateway to life. Oh, Max, I believe you. Here you are happy, even though you can't put on your Romeo and Juliet because Larry Olivier can't make it. So what? Max, if I asked you for a favor, something that's very important to me... Lily, anything you want. You just ask for it and it's yours. All right, Max. Here it is. I want you to give Edwin the part of Romeo. Miss Cooper. Yes, Mr. Garland. Can you send down for some bromo salsa, please? <laughs> Montague again. Lily, uh, have mercy. Max, you have to do this for me. I can't do it, Lily. I can't. Now, Max... Wait, Max. What time is it? It's about 3.25. Oh, good. May I turn on this radio? Sure, why? Well, just sit back, Max. Listen to this. Oh, Uncle Goodhart, you fixed the little dicky bird's wing. And, and we wanted you to destroy the canary. Oh, how could we have been so cruel, so blind? Look at this little canary. Remember this canary as you go through life. 
Oh, Uncle Goodhart, look. The canary's opened his eyes. He's stirring. Golly. Shh. This is the crisis. It's opening its mouth. It sings. It sings. Yes, my children, it sings. Remember this, you, Melissa, worrying because your father's business went bankrupt and your home burned down. You, Ronald, fretting because Melissa's father is peeved at you for stealing all his cash out of his business in order to raise bail for your mother. <laughs> Think how small and insignificant these things are. Think how small and insignificant these things are alongside of this little bird with a broken wing. It sings. Just as you must sing as you walk out into the sunshine and life. You have been listening to another episode of Uncle Goodheart, brought to you by Shalimar Soap. And now before we leave you until tomorrow, here is Uncle Goodheart and his thought for the day. When you see a friend in trouble in the cold without a coat, facing snow and sleet and blizzard, won't you drop a little note? <laughs> What's this all about? Max, that was Edwin Montague. Yes, sir. Miss Cooper, make that a double bromo. <laughs> well, Max, holy, I can't believe... Edwin Montague, Uncle Goodhart. Well, Max, the harbor part of it all is that he likes it. He likes it? Oh, no. This is the man who corrected the English in Shakespeare before he'd lower himself to read the lines. <laughs> Max, his whole life is wrapped up in this Uncle Goodhart. I've got to get him back into the theater before it's too late. You have to let him play Romeo. But, Lily, I hesitated with Laurence Olivier because I thought he was a little old. <laughs> Now Montague is Romeo. Oh, Lily, this is, is... I'm putting this on with my own money. Give me a fighting chance. <laughs> Max, I'm handing you a smash hit. Are you blind? All I can see is Montague tottering up that ladder to Juliet's balcony. <laughs> That'll take a whole act in itself. <laughs> Lily, I can't. Max, use your head. The one Shakespearean play Edwin Montague has never done. Romeo and Juliet. His farewell Shakespearean appearance. Farewell appearance. That always drags him in. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, the strong play, teamed with Catherine Cornell, that never hurts. McClintic to direct. You know, it's starting to sound... But Edwin Montague is Romeo. Oh, no! <laughs> Max, he'll be wonderful. You always said he had the magic. Once he's on that stage, he'll be 18 again. Oh, Max, for me. For yourself. For the theater. Well, Max... Okay, Lily, you got me. He's Romeo. Oh, Max. Please, back with Montague. That means I'll have to dig up his old makeup man, the one I hate. And the valet, the one who steals. <laughs> and I have to break this to Catherine Cornell. Oh, hello there. Hello there. What was that? Nothing. I was just welcoming back my ulcer. <laughs> Montague was Romeo. Lily, will he do it for me? Oh, don't worry, Max. I know my husband. There's only one sure way to get Montague to take a part. Tell him he can't have it. I tell you, Agnes, I don't like to talk about radio and Uncle Goodhart, but when I put that little splint on the canary's broken wing... Well, all I can tell you is that when I looked in the control room, the engineers were just sitting there with tears streaming down their faces. It's silly, but uh, I, I myself choked up. Here's your tea. I better dunk the tea bag for you. You're shattered. <laughs> I tell you, Agnes, the impact of that little dicky bird, broken in body, suddenly bursting into song. Did you hear Uncle Goodhart today? No. I heard it yesterday without getting sick. I didn't want to press my luck. Uh, well, what can you expect from a just plain bill, listener? Agnes, you have all the charm and understanding of a bucket of chicken feet. 
Thank you, dear Uncle Goodhart. For the first Good time in my life, I feel that I'm close to humanity, close to the people. Oh, it's wonderful. You've never been in a subway at six o'clock. <laughs> Agnes, my dear, it is only this insane loyalty that my wife has for you that stands between you being in our home and back setting up pins in a bowling alley. <laughs> Hello, Edwin. Hello, Agnes. Hi, honey. Ah, Lily. Ah, tea. Sit down. I was just about to pour some for your husband over his head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Edwin, isn't Agnes refreshing? Mm. Firstly, I'll take a cup of hot lard. <laughs> Coming right up. <laughs> oh, now, now. Oh, Edwin, I'm proud of you. I heard Uncle Goodhart today. You did, Lily? Really? Edwin, it was simply magnificent. The canary scene, eh? Oh, it's... It only made me cry, that's all. And that ending. When it burst into song. It's some dramatic walloper. I tell you, Lily, these new writers on the program, how they do it, I don't know. It's beyond me. You know, Lily, when you think it took Eugene O'Neill four years to write Strange Interlude, <laughs> yet those boys come up day after day with this wonderful stuff. <laughs> Starts a man of thinking, a heap of thinking. I'll just mosey into the kitchen. I got a heap of cooking to do, a heap of cooking. <laughs> ah, Lily, remember ten years ago when Agnes had pneumonia and you nursed her through it? I'll never forgive you for it. <laughs> Edwin, I was wrong about wanting you to take an interest in the theater again. That life is over for you. You are the perfect Uncle Goodhart. Even Max said so. Max? Max Garland? Yes, I went to his office. We heard the program together. Really? Well, what did Max the Moron think of it? <laughs> loved it, loved it. He did, eh? Crazy about well, it. Well, one thing I always did say about Max was occasionally he had flashes of extremely good taste. <laughs> By the way, did Max get another Romeo? No, but he's not worried. Plenty of top flight Shakespearean actors still around. Sure. Max seems kind of sold on Burgess Meredith. <laughs> oh, gee. A boy from Hollywood. <laughs> He'll insist on a song and at least two dance numbers. Of course, there's always Maurice Evans. <laughs> and who else? <laughs> well, uh, naturally, your name, Edwin Montague, came up, but Max and I laughed. You did? Uh, we mentioned Duane Denton. Stock actor. <laughs> Lily, uh, what do you mean you laughed? Edwin, you as Romeo, it's ridiculous. You've never played it. You don't know the rules. Oh, yes, Max even talked of getting Orson Welles. Too fat. <laughs> Lily, I don't know Romeo. I don't know Romeo. Edwin, it's silly to discuss it. I don't know Romeo. But soft, what light through yonder window streaks? Yonder window breaks. Yonder window breaks. <laughs> it is the west. East. It is the East, and Juliet is the star. Sun. And the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the jealous moon. The envious moon. Uh, the envious moon, who is already sick and weak with grief. Pale with grief. Pale with grief. <laughs> that you, her maid. Thou, her maid. That thou, her maid, is far more fair than she are. It is my lady. Oh! It is my love. Huh? And I don't know Romeo. <laughs> uh, Lily? Lily, what's the matter? I'm being foolish, Edwin. Lily, you're crying. Oh, Edwin, it was so beautiful. The depth and tenderness. You seem surprised. What did you expect, brain? <laughs> well, it's just that it's been so long since I heard anything like that. I guess I just forgot what a truly great actor you are, isn't he, Agnes? He's a great actor. You ain't doing so bad yourself. <laughs> Edwin, when you recited those lines just now, I, I, I suddenly saw you bathed in an amber spotlight. I got that wonderful chill I used to get watching you from the wings doing Brutus in Julius Caesar. Friends, Romans, <laughs> lend me your ears. You are Hamlet. The soul, the soul. The soul's the thing. Oh, why torture myself with these foolish hopes that Edwin Montague will ever present to the theater the one Shakespearean play he's never done, Romeo and Juliet. Edwin Montague and Romeo and Juliet. You know, Lily, maybe, uh... No, no, Edwin. You have your Uncle Goodhart. 
It's better, as Max puts it. And how does Max put it? <laughs> well, he said the magnificent Montague is like a great thoroughbred. He's run his race. I've run my race. <laughs> and now, with his glorious victories behind him, he's earned his right to be put out in the pasture of radio to graze. <laughs> put out to graze. Why, that stupid, insignificant, wretched little man. Edwin! So he thinks I'm through, eh? Well, Max, didn't he? He thinks I can't play Romeo, eh? Edwin, don't... I'll give him a Romeo. I'll give him a Romeo that will send Evans, Olivier, Gilgood, and the rest of those frauds scurrying back to their little dramatic schools. <laughs> you can't! What about your Uncle Goodhart program? Oh, that illiterate, drooling poppycock. I'll toss it off in the afternoon. But at night, at night, Lily... Kit Cornell and I will give them a Romeo and Juliet that will make the theatre ring with glory once again. Oh, Edwin, I can't wait for that curtain. What a performance it'll be, won't it, Agnes? Honey, there's only one performance I don't want to miss. The magnificent Montague trying to get into the tights he wore eight years ago. Oh. <laughs> Agnes, get the door. That's Max. Okay, honey. Max! Agnes. So it's you and Montague again. You're joining our happy little family. That's right, Agnes. Come in. Welcome to Devil's Island. <laughs> Hello, Max. Is everything okay? Oh, I guess so. I just came from Catherine Cornell's place. I sprung the news that her new Romeo is going to be Edwin Montague. She was thrilled? Yes, after the first shock wore off. Where is he? He's in his den, waiting to make an entrance. Agnes, will you call him? Okay, I'll knock. On stage, Mr. Montague. Agnes, did you... Uh, Max Garland. <laughs> well, I can't believe my eyes. Max, my dear, dear friend, what a surprise. Not bad for only two hours rehearsal. <laughs> Uh, you remember Agnes, Max, our little 40-year-old juvenile delinquent. <laughs> Two of you still at it, huh? This is like old times. No, Max, it's not going to be like old times. All those arguments we had. For what, Max? For what? Yes, Edwin, we live and learn. Yes, we had 15 wonderful, exciting years together. <laughs> Quiet, Jessica Dragonette. <laughs> Yes, Max. Why should the memories of those years be marred by one, one flop, King Lear? Sure. After all those hits, what's one flop? This time, Max, you're the boss. You make the decisions. Thank you, Edwin. Max, from now on, I'm just a lamb. You're the shepherd. Just lead me. Where do we open? New Haven. That is definitely out. <laughs> Here's a promo, Max. Edwin, Max wants... No more college towns. I am an artist. I refuse to be treated as merely an intermission between football games. <laughs> all right, all right, Edwin. We'll open in Philly. Now, about the billing. I spoke to Catherine Cornell Ah, and... the billing. My name in lights again. Oh, how it was. Edwin Montague in Hamlet with Lily Boehm. Edwin Montague in, in Julius Caesar with Lily Boehm. Now it's all changed. It's going to be Edwin Montague and Romeo and Juliet with Catherine Cornell. <coughs> Max, Max, what's the matter? Let me pound you on the back, old man. Don't touch me. But, Max. Edwin Montague and Romeo and Juliet with Catherine Cornell. Are you crazy? Catherine Cornell getting second billing? Yes, Edwin, be reasonable. Reasonable? I'm a star in my entire career. My name has always stood out alone. Mostly on unemployment insurance checks. <laughs> Agnes, when the script calls for animal noises, we'll let you know. <laughs> Montague, Catherine Cornell is going to give you equal billing. It's the most gracious gesture you could ask for. Edwin, she's a great star. What am I? Hoot Gibson? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Edwin, we'll settle all this at the first rehearsal. First rehearsal. Say, when is this first rehearsal? Why? You ought to notify the governor so he can declare martial law. <laughs> Agnes, by some fantastic miracle, the American theater has managed to survive so far without your advice. When the subject of our conversation turns to the cleaning of a chicken, we will solicit your opinion. You're sweet. Edwin, this is a big chance. Romeo and Juliet. And with Catherine Cornell. 
She told me how she admires you. She does? Yes. In fact, she wondered why the handsome, dashing Montague had never done Romeo. She did? Yes, in fact, her exact words were, he'll be the perfect Romeo for me. All he has to do is to shave off that beard. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a kumquat in the oven. <laughs> So Catherine Cordell wants me to shave off my beard. Now, Ed... Quiet! Does the traditions of the American stage mean so little to Catherine Cordell that with one word she is willing to cut off one of the few remaining landmarks of the theater? <laughs> Edwin... Silence! To become just another blank face in this world of blank faces? Never! Never! Oh, well, that ends it. I tried, Lily. Wait, Max. Edwin. No! It means Uncle Goodhart for the rest of your life. Oh, Lily, stop it. Mending a canary's broken wing. Lily, for heaven's sake, take pity. Next week it may be an Airedale with a sliver in his paw. <laughs> Lily, you're a thief. Edwin, is it going to be Uncle Goodhart or this from Romeo and Juliet? Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Say it, Edwin, say it. Shall I hear more or shall I speak at this? It is but thy name that is my enemy. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor feet, nor arm, nor face. Nor beard. Nor beard. <laughs> nor beard. Oh, that's what it says in the play. It does? Shakespeare said that? Yes. Well, Edwin. Nor beard. Is it coming off, Edwin? If that's the way Shakespeare wanted it, so shall it be. Oh, Edwin. I'll call Catherine and tell her. Please. Now, if you'd excuse me, I, I'd like to be left alone. Alone to spend these last few remaining hours with it. <laughs> Edwin, we understand. Thank you. But let no man say he ever sacrificed more for his art. Is the magnificent beard coming off of the magnificent Montague? Join us again next Friday at the same time and find out what happens to the magnificent Montague starring Monty Woolley, directed by Nat Hyken and written by Nat Hyken and Billy Friedberg. And Seymour was Lily Boehm, Pert Kelton was Agnes. Included in tonight's cast were Anita Anton, Bob Hastings, John Griggs, and Bob Sweeney. Jack Ward at the organ, your announcer Don Pardo. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs next when Ed Gardner stars as Archie the manager in Duffy's Tavern. Duffy won't be there as usual, but Archie and his remarkable friends are all on hand to provide customers with their own whimsical brand of humor. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just leave your dial right here on NBC. And for top listening this Sunday, NBC brings you another broadcast of The Big Show. Now join the gang at Duffy's Tavern on NBC.